What's going on, guys? Thank you so much for downloading the episode. Really appreciate that. My guest today is both Lauren Mueller and Casey Bowker, owner and operator of Don't Forget a Towel. And there's an interesting reason as to why they're both on the episode. You'll check that out in a couple seconds. Um, check out the link below for Don't Forget a Towel. Today we discuss 2011's fantasy adventure movie Sucker Punch, starring Emily Browning, Abby Cornish, and Vanessa Hudgens. Uh, this was an interesting movie. I really hope you guys enjoy our take on it. Uh, it's a weird one, and I don't know. I really, I really like this episode. Uh, make sure you like, share, and comment on everything that you can to get this podcast more in the limelight. Um, we're going to have some pretty big things coming your way shortly, so stay tuned for that. Also, stay tuned for the upcoming YouTube video where we're going to announce the winner of our winter giveaway. Really excited about that. Uh, but without further ado, on with the show. Welcome to Gutsy Media Podcast, because movies are our lives. I'm joined today by my two amazing guests, Casey Bowker and Laura Mueller. Thank you very much for returning. Um, Casey, no offense to you. This was not supposed to be your episode. We are, we're we're oh. gonna st- we're gonna start off as we always do with determining how we got oh. to where we are. We are talking today about 2011's Sucker Punch. Um, Lauren picked the movie. Uh, you want to go into detail about why you picked this movie and why Casey is here with us? For sure. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh. So Sucker Punch, um, when it first came out, it was back in the family video days. And I remember Casey, it was either you came into work or I think you might have texted me like, you need to go see this movie. I just saw this awesome movie, totally up your alley. And you like gave me some snippets of the movie. And I was like, okay, sure. (laughs) I'll get on that. (laughs) And then I never did. So then it came out, and I thought nothing of it, and it came out, and I saw it in the the drawer, like, you know, before all the movies came out, and I was like, okay, I'll take this one home, I'll watch it, and then I can tell Casey I watched it, and whatever, whatever. And I took it home, and I immediately called Casey, and I was like, I am so sorry, I should have seen this in theaters, (laughs) I missed out. (laughs) Um, And then from then on, I... May or may not have watched it in the store, which is totally a no-no, but that's okay. (laughs) I would go around and I would turn all the monitors off. Um, So, like, after, it was, like, 11, 11.30, because, you know, family videos open until midnight. Was, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I turned all the monitors off, and I would just listen to it. Like, this movie has one of my all-time favorite soundtracks. For sure. Which, of course, I also reached out to Casey for. Like, hey, I know you have this. Uh, <laughs> let me get that, please. But I, I can't think of Sucker Punch without thinking of Casey. And uh, when you asked me what movie I wanted to do, this movie came to mind. And I knew I just couldn't do it justice without Casey here. So Yeah, you, you replied back pretty fast that you wanted to do Sucker Punch. And you wanted to do it with Casey. So uh, <laughs> so we made it happen. Um The three of us are going to talk about Sucker Punch. (laughs) (laughs) So one thing you got to know going into season two, we are no longer wandering aimlessly through the woods. We actually have a purpose now. Um, It feels it feels pretty special. I'm I'm, I'm excited to finally have a purpose in life. Uh, What we're going to try to determine today through our conversation and and some uh, some questions I might have later is, was this a good movie? And as you both know, as being movie fans, this is very subjective. Uh, you have some people that will approach a movie from a critic standpoint and look at fine details and and directorial you know movements and and the cast and crew and the lighting and tell you if the movie was good or not. And other people will approach it simply from an entertainment standpoint and tell you that it's the the greatest movie of all time. They watched it a million times. So just keep that in mind as we go through this episode. Hmm. Pretty so- pretty excited. When we get to that point in time, remind me to tell you how I pitch this movie to other people. Okay. I can't wait to hear it. Okay. Perfect. So this movie is it it's it first off directed by uh, Zack Snyder, which 
anybody who's seen any Zack Snyder films automatically know the 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 picturesque scenery that is dark, filtered um, storytelling. Everything <laughs> in his movies is rainy and dark and gray, which when I he, personally love. When it rains. When it rains, exactly. <laughs> uh, the movie the the movie comes out um, March twenty fifth, two thousand and eleven. It's approximately a hundred and nine minutes, which is is right in that sweet spot of uh, just over an hour and a half, which I like. I, I talk many times about this in the podcast between um, 90 minutes and 120 minutes is like perfect. A hundred and nine minutes. You sure on that one? According to the Wikipedia that I'm staring at right now, it says runtime 109 minutes. Depends on so the that- version. I was going to say, we watched the extended version, which is an hour and 50 minutes. Correct. So the extended version is slightly longer. Um, I, I So when the movie first came out, I did watch it, uh, again, probably based on Casey's recommendation or, or Lauren's recommendation. Um, I don't probably. remember I, I don't remember if I saw the extended cut that time or not, but uh, watching the extended cut this time, I didn't really remember a whole lot of differences. I've only seen it the two times. Uh, the budget for this movie was $82 million. It made $90 million. So really from a Hollywood success. standpoint, it's, I mean, it's, it's not really a successful film. It um, it's a success. <laughs> <laughs> kind of want to see your budget at least doubled, I think, uh, to be a success. Uh, I mean, higher than that would be better, but I think uh, only making $8 million on an $82 million budget probably isn't the best. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know where, where to begin with this film. So the opening scene, even kind of while the opening credits are rolling and and the opening music is going, you have this storytelling that is done without any words, uh, almost through the music, which is amazing. And you see our main character who goes by the nickname Baby Doll. Uh, She and her sister are living with mom and stepdad mom passes away stepdad is abusive stepdad attempts to abuse uh baby doll attempts to stop him using a revolver um and in the process shoots her sister you don't i don't know if they go into detail if she kills her sister on accident or if it's just a wounding um she does because it's not really mentioned any any point in the film though i mean I think I think it's, it's you're led to believe that because obviously the stepfather has her kind of committed to the asylum, which is where the bulk of the movie takes place. Um, but again, this all happens during opening credits. I was going to ask you before you even got into this to try and give a brief like, can you explain what this movie is about? <laughs> um, I want to see like this is the fun part. Can you give a quick here's what this movie is a hundred percent a hundred percent this movie is about a a a group of females in a institution who through the power of dance and storytelling attempt to escape i mean that's that's it that's that's the movie I th- that sounds like showgirls <laughs> <laughs> It, it, this so, <laughs> here's what doing, here's what I want to know. There, I want to some of these movies that we watch and we review, especially for the podcast. I want to be a fly on the wall when this is pitched to the studio, because this movie is deranged. Point. I should have pitched this. So, doing a bit of research for this podcast, I guess the crew referred to it as "One Flew Over the Matrix" is how they referred to this movie, which is I, I read the same quote and. So, I mean, this is, it's bound to come out at some point during this podcast, and it might as well come out in the beginning. I did not like this movie. Like, no. So, I was going to say, I would have gone more for, for a One Flew Over Inception, or like, I would have tied in Inception here, but Inception wasn't a thing yet, so. Um. This, this movie has an amazing soundtrack. This movie has amazing cinematography. This movie has amazing choreography. Some of the scenes are just beautifully shot. Mm-hmm. And and the combat scenes are amazing. 
but ultimately the storyline makes little to no sense. There is little to no plot. There, the it's it's incoherent at best. It's a collection of short stories tied loosely together by insanity. And yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think I think if you would have taken any one of these montages or these dream sequences and made them their own movies or given them their own plots, that would have been a much more intriguing film to me. But the the fact that they tried to loosely tie this together with the backstory of the insane asylum and then that w- weird monologue at the end by John Hamm or the ripoff of the one flew over the cuckoo's nest ending with the, the shock treatment and the lobotomy. I, I did not like this movie. Are we, are we, so you typically like go through the whole movie. Are we doing that? <laughs> or is this like, <laughs> did we just finish this episode? <laughs> that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. I mean, no, I mean, we, I definitely want to go through the plot, um, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm all about sign tangents. And I think that if this is where the conversation spurs us, let, let me, let's go. What do you, what do you guys think? You don't got to tell me if you liked it or not, but I mean, what do what are your rebuttals to any of the things I just said? So there's a lot more to the plot than the surface level of let's escape this asylum. It's it's to me it was more diving into this the psychological and you see her um before she starts before baby doll starts her dances, which we'll get into more. It's um there's a few shots where they actually like take you through mirrors and that's um, supposed to be in reference to like an Alice in Wonderland. You're going to Wonderland or you're going to um, this world that she's created for herself or this reality that she's created to escape the abuses or the, the terrors of this insane asylum. And um, I think there's just more to it than that surface value. Um, I won't give away my thoughts of the movie yet or my, my tagline for the movie yet, but um, I mean, it's, it's got an amazing cast. Like, I think this is probably the first movie that I saw Oscar Isaac's in. It is. Yeah. I mean, probably. Yeah. I don't uh, remember seeing him before this. So not, not think- just that. I mean, Emily Browning, who's, who's a star plays baby doll. I actually saw her, or I, I should say that I probably saw this first, but she's in an amazing, um, TV show that I watched, I, I think you guys probably watched it too, called American Gods. If you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend it. It's an it's an absolutely stunning TV show. Um, but she's naturally got brown hair, so you don't really she doesn't look familiar in a lot of movies because of that. She she doesn't stand out as much with the blonde hair. Um, she's been in like Magic Mike. She was in Sleeping Beauty, Sucker Punch, obviously. Um, I mean, nothing. she's in Sucker Punch. Wait, I know, crazy. She's in a, a series of unfortunate events. That's how I yep. first remember her from the yeah, first. She, she's from the movie version. Yeah, from right. The movie. She's in the movie Legend, um, which is a, is a pretty decent movie as well, I think. Um, and then obviously you got a couple other big names. Uh, Abby Cornish is in this movie. She plays kind of the the second, I would say, uh, to uh, to Baby Doll. She's Sweet Pea. Uh, you have obviously Vanessa Hudgens. This is a, either her first movie or second movie. I mean, she's not big actor in this. I mean, she came off of uh, her high school musical into this. This was supposed to be her, like, I'm an actor. Don't think yeah. of me as Disney. So the girls had to go through some extensive uh, training prior to filming. Uh, weightlifting and so on and apparently she she found that to be very difficult and was able to use a lot of that um torture-esque training in the crying scenes in the movie which her acting yeah uh, yes. as you guys mentioned uh, um, oscar isaac john ham is in the movie uh, jamie chung is in the movie i think she's a good actress um so i mean casey right over dr gorski Come on, man. Oh, yeah, which was originally supposed to be Angelina Jolie. It was. I think uh, you read all the same stuff I did. <laughs> prob- probably. Although, uh, 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 Carla Gugino? Gugino. Gugino. Uh, uh, she's a great actress. I, I <clears throat> Excuse me. I love her in um, Sin City. Amazing say. movie. I love her in that. 
Um, but so Casey, you're oddly silent. You probably spurred. She's actually the, watching of Hill House. That's probably the most recent thing. Or excuse yeah, me, Bly that's, Manor. That's such a crazy, crazy movie. Um, you probably so spurred the interest in this movie in both me and Lauren, and you're sitting back quietly. I mean, what do you have to say for yourself? I mean, you guys are going back and forth. I'm just enjoying the show. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Angelina Jolie was supposed to be Dr. Gorski, uh, <laughs> but Emma Stone was originally uh, not necessarily offered, but she was considered for Baby Doll. So uh, was Brie Larson. Yep. Which is insane. They're both good well, enough actors to turn down the role. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also thought it was funny that bef- like Emily Browning and Jenna Malone both thought about quitting acting around this movie. So um, Emily Browning, due to um, how poorly the movie did, and then Jenna Malone actually came back into acting to work with uh, Zack Snyder. Which is... In, insane. I mean, he he his next movie following Sucker Punch uh, is Man of Steel, and then obviously uh, you know Batman vs Superman, and eventually Justice League, which you know we got shafted out of, and, and luckily are getting uh, a new cut. But so, so Baby Doll enters the asylum. She gets kind of the the tour, and it's this is where this is the first derailment in the asylum, which is is basically run by Oscar Isaac. Um, the stepfather kind of pays him to have her lobotomized, but because they don't have a doctor on site to do it, they have to wait for the doctor to come in five days. Now, this entire conversation about her lobotomy is happening in front of her. Uh, she spends the first 18 minutes of the movie, not speaking at all, which ultimately you think while this is happening, it's gotta be done for a reason. There's obviously going to be something, you know, there's, she's not speaking. It's leading up to some profound, nope. Once she starts speaking, it's just she starts speaking and that's it. There's no real but reason she was, why. It, I took it as the whole point was she's traumatized by the death of her mother. To the point, obviously after the fact is when her stepfather is being abusive and whatever, but he says that she's being committed because in the grief after her mother's death, she had a fit she was in a fit and accidentally shot her sister. So her silence was her just in response to all of that is how I took it. So why is she also, being it lobotomized? Also, it was 24 minutes. It was 24 minutes after. For the extended the cut, yeah. Why is she being, She's being lobotomized? lobotomized? She's being lobotomized because her father, her stepfather, tried to abuse her and is trying to silence her. Okay, so... He's lobotomizing her to silence her, even though she's not talking. And she could have solved this by talking minutes. prior to going to the insane asylum. Either way, I'm willing to I'm willing to look all that aside. They get into the insane asylum. They had this conversation in front of her about how she's going to be lobotomized. Stepfather leaves. She's then introduced to the good doctor and the rest of the crew. She's introduced to them because the doctor likes to do therapy through dance. So the doctor is going to play some music and the girls dance their their part out, which ergo is going to make them better. Am I, am I with the plot of the movie so far? So the doctor doesn't make them dance in reality, does she? I thought they were, <laughs> they, they go to the theater because she's, at, they're doing, they're like acting out scenes. So, so in reality, they're acting it out when in the alternate reality that they go into it's a club so they're dancing so you got to think about it like three layers there's the real world there's the club world and then there's the video game world so everything quote unquote real is happening in the insane asylum and then when you go into the club you are inside probably sweet peas mind probably and then, um, obviously, then there's the the video game world. So they're dancing, yes, in the club world in order to survive. And I think they go into that to deal to deal with the problems of the actual real world. Right. So I think somewhere buried into this, there is a coherent 
understanding of how these worlds exist. My, I mean, I, I, I can take that this club world is created because of the trauma these girls have, have suffered and therefore yeah. they have a break in reality and have to go into this kind of parallel um, creation that they have joint yeah. hysteria, if you will. So this club world is they are all dancers in the club run by um, Oscar Isaac and Blue. they, yeah, his name is blue, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So he, he runs the club, the girls dance uh, and then if somebody in the audience likes them, they get to take them back to the room and, and whatever. And um, baby doll is just like a savant when it comes to dancing. She dances and, and hypnotizes people almost to the point of literal hypnotizing them. <laughs> um, and while she dances, she kind of goes into these. Uh, I don't even know how to describe them. Alternate worlds video um game. yeah video game boss fights yeah basically that that's a very good way of putting it the yeah. first one she goes into she faces these three giant samurais stone samurais in an, an amazing fight sequence again the, the cinematography and choreography in this movie is phenomenal it really is very very good and when i saw these three samurai guys i was like this is going to be badass this is amazing and it was she earns the trust of the other girls and convinces them that they need to break out of the club, ergo the asylum. But in order to do so, they need these four items. Well, five. technically it's five items, but only four of which she knows that she needs as of right now. They are the map, the knife, the fire, um, which is a lighter, and the key. And not in any particular order. And basically, for the remainder of the movie, she does a little dance. She goes into the video game boss fight, if you will, during which one of the girls steals one of the items and brings it back to her. The map is done relatively easy. The lighter is done relatively easy. Uh, In the course of stealing the knife, there is an issue... Um, the music stops. She's pulled out of this video game boss fight. The person she is trying to hypnotize is hypnotized, doesn't get hypnotized, uh, wakes up. And I, Oscar Isaac is kind of on to them at this point anyway. Um, but they managed to get the knife anyway. Well, Oscar, the girl dies. I mean, yeah, so the girl, that. the girl dies. <laughs> she gets stabbed. No big. <laughs> well, this is kind of like the start of the end. One of them gets stabbed in the process of stealing the knife. Oscar Isaac shoots two others um, for the basically the betrayal of trying to steal these items. Mm-hmm. Although at no point in time does he go searching for the items to get them back. Um, instead, he tries to sleep with Baby Doll, and in turn, Baby Doll is able to stab him in the collarbone and steal the key, which is the last item. And now there's only two people left. There's Sweet Pea and Baby Doll. They use the items to escape, which at this point, they're now kind of back in the asylum and they're escaping the asylum. Mm -hmm. And when they get to, you know, just outside in the parking lot area to to kind of go through the gate, the final, the final gate, um, Baby Doll realizes that she is the the fifth item and that she must use her dancing to distract the, the people at the gate so that Sweet Pea can escape. And because um, ultimately throughout the story, you're, you're led to believe that Sweepy really isn't crazy, that uh, she's there because of her sister, Rocket, who's also one of the girls, uh, the one that gets stabbed by the knife. And um, I mean, Baby Doll's caught, Sweet Peas gets free and, and lives out the rest of her life, presumably happy-go-lucky. Baby Doll's caught and ultimately lobotomized. If you listen to the intro... The voiceover as you're, as they're, I, I guess it's really as they're going to the asylum. It's after the scene of, um, I believe, the shooting. It's all about guardian angels. <clears throat> so that's kind of supposed to set up the idea that Baby Doll is one of Sweet Pea's guardian angels. And I also took it as throughout the whole movie, there's, um, the wise man 
who is basically giving Baby Doll and the other girls pep talks, basically. He's like the the poster. Um, what am I trying to say here? Yeah, so he, he always has like the inspirational quotes. And he's it, also the one who gives Baby Doll all of the all of her weapons and right. everything like that. But so he, he shows up. He's also the, another he, one. Right, he shows up in the video game worlds only, in the in, no. in most of, in most oh, of the movie, okay. he shows okay. up only in the video game worlds. He is the one that tells her that she needs these five items, lays out four of them, and says that the fifth one will will come to her when when mm-hmm. she needs it. And uh, he, like you said, he usually ends his little monologue in each one of these these video game sessions with some sort of inspirational quote that usually makes little to no sense. Um. But ultimately, when Sweet Pea escapes, she's almost caught at a bus station um, trying to get on a bus. And the driver turns out to be him, who who basically says to her, like, you're safe now. You know, go have a seat. We'll take care of you or whatever. The, his his storyline makes I don't makes any no sense to me. How is how is he in the video game stories? If he never actually interacts with Baby Doll at all, he's a guardian angel. He's Sweet Pea's guardian angel. Mm-hmm. But so I, is Baby Doll. So is Baby Doll. I feel like I Baby feel like Doll, you two Baby are Doll looking at me like this. This is an easily understood movie, and I'm the crazy one for not understanding it. <laughs> it's. I mean, you have to watch the movie. I've watched this movie. More times than I care to admit, that's for sure. And originally, one time I watched it and I was like, "This movie is just badass. Like, it's it makes no sense. No, it doesn't." I, I'm watching it. The cast is amazing. The soundtrack is amazing. I'm watching Emily Browning run around with a pistol and a samurai sword the whole time because you know those are the normal weapons you're given in a skimpy sailor costume like this is normal um she's also fighting but, zombie nazis at one point yep and a that's, dragon that's like very hellboy-esque the um steam revived isn't there a guy in hellboy like yes that? um klaus anyways yeah. it's it, it takes a like it if you want it I can't even explain it. If you want to dive into it, there's there's a lot more to the movie that you can understand and that you can give background to. Otherwise, you just take it at surface value, which is, this movie makes no sense, but it's, as you said, amazing cinematography, amazing soundtrack. It's badass. These are great scenes. And that's, it may I, be I, a jumbled mess, but there's there's depth to it if you want to give it that. I think ultimately that's one of the reasons why I dislike the movie is because it has these amazing building blocks. I mean, I can't, I cannot give it kudos enough for the, the fight scenes and the CGI in this movie looks awesome. I think that has to do with Zack Snyder's kind of dark grayish tint that he puts on his movies is that it tends to hide some of the CGI a little bit. Um, it, it's very well done as far as those scenes go and the soundtrack is most notably, you know, one of the best soundtracks in the last 20 years, probably. Um, but despite those elements, despite that, that step forward in those areas, it lacks tremendously in just coherent story. And that to me is what you should start with is, is a coherent story and then have these extra things added onto it. Well, I mean, with that being said, there's tons of movies, especially ones we've covered on the podcast where it's like, yeah, you do some research, uh, you look more into the movie. And and I've said many times, a lot of times that'll lead me to liking the the movie more because you get some of that backstory that you don't normally get in the movie itself. But here it's like, it's not, it's not forefront enough for me to read that information later and then look at the movie and go, Oh, now I see it. Now I see (laughs) that thing. It's in there somewhere. It's just hidden here. It's like, well, you didn't even touch on that. How am I supposed to pick you know, th- that type of stuff? All this top 40 music is so boring. Jeez, I sure wish I had something geeky to listen to. Well, I've got just the thing for you, stranger. 
Who are you and how did you get in my house? Don't even worry about that. If you're looking for the latest, greatest, and geekiest podcasts around, you should check out Those Geeks You Know. Those Geeks You Know? Wow! Three friends talking about comic books, movies, TV shows, all the things that I geek out about. But seriously, you gotta leave now. Be sure to check out Those Geeks You Know on iTunes and Stitcher. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter and tell everybody that you know. You, you got to leave. I called the cops. You don't care enough to find out what the, what the I don't, hidden gem I don't think it's be. so much caring. I think it's like typically when I read that stuff after the fact, I can go back in my memory or back to the movie and say, oh, I see that. I see it sprinkled in, and now those little subtleties make sense. Right. Whereas here, I don't see the subtleties at all. I mean, I, I can I can understand that some of that backstory you know, might've been part of the character and the research they did and how they prepared for the role, but I don't see it in the film. Lauren looks really mad at me right now. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm, I'm taking it in. I, uh, I mean like, yeah, I, I'll tell you. Convince so, me. Tell me what is, what no, is it I'm missing? Hold on. I was going to say that when I, when I tell people about this movie, I tell them it's a bad movie, but I absolutely love it. Because I'll agree with you, it's a jumbled mess, but I am willing to, I don't, I don't know what won me over that first time I saw it, if I just took it at face value and was like, I have no idea what this movie is about, but I don't care because I'm watching this, these crazy scenes. And then I gave it those rewatch opportunities and then just fell in love with it. Um... Yeah, I don't have a way to win you over. I think I just happened to catch it and fall in love with it. And it's it's a bad movie, but I absolutely love it. Here's one of the things I will say about this movie, which is unlike any other movie I've seen. I could I could take a scene from this movie, just one scene, and show it to somebody. And they'd be like, that looks amazing. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't matter what scene it is. If you show somebody one scene, they're going to be like, this, is, this looks like a really badass movie. The problem is, is they don't go together. This, this movie did win an award. Did you read what it was? I did not. I'm, I'm assuming soundtrack related. No. Visual. Best trailer. Oh, that's oh, right. That's, that's right. That's right. I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. It, an amazing trailer. Again, you get this one little right? segment of the did movie. Did you watch it? I did. Did you actually watch it? Mm-hmm. Casey, you're being I quiet. I watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I'm sure I did 12 years ago. Or uh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> That's why I saw the movie. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I mean, I don't know that we watched the movie that they gave me a trailer for, but it's okay. I still enjoyed it. <laughs> you, mean, you mean Hollywood lied to you in the trailer? That never happens. Yeah, right? Weird, right? Oh, um, I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to, I had a random question for Casey, so go ahead. Oh please, I, I want I want to hear more from Casey on this movie. Well, I just I don't know if it was really a question, but like, did you? No, it is a question. Did you notice the name of the institution that they're in? Um. And do you know the relevance of it? Basically, what it, what is it? It's the Lennox House for cr- the criminally criminally insane. Yeah. Okay. So I. I noted that, but I don't know what the reference is. Annie so, Lennox, because it plays Sweet Dreams yes, in the beginning, exactly. probably. Yeah. yeah exactly. So I was coming to like, the music master about that one. Yeah, like this is like one giant music video, really, that yeah. just happens to. Yep. That's it. You know, like I like Bjork um, and like mm-hmm. the Bjork scene where she's fighting all the robots and everything like that whole oh, yeah. scene is insane and i like that they got away with so much on a pg-13 rating so like the zombies are steam powered so they're not blood no and blood. the robots are robots so no one cares about that and then the orcs you don't ever like lord of the rings has decapitations left and right but because they're not humans it doesn't matter so they did they got away with that as well in this so Anytime you go into the video game world, it's like, whew, okay, this is cool. And then you go back into the real world, and it's like, okay, I get it. You have to get these keys. When you go into the dancing world, that's when it's like, "Mm, mm, 
so the high roller guy shows up and and he's gonna lobotomize you or 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 uh or sex traffic you. you or whatever yeah, like, <laughs> no, he's supposed to take her virginity One or the other. that's what the that's what the the guy is selling so here's the other thing about about the whole orc scene are the orcs trying to break into the castle or break out of the castle i feel like they're like because the humans are breaking into the castle yeah. right All the orcs are, orcs are trying to keep them out yeah so when they they're fly over the originally there are orcs on the outside trying to barge into the big wooden doors humans and are going right into the into no yeah. orcs are yeah. Because when they come back out of the castle to leave, the orcs are on the other side of the door and they open it inwards. And that's where they have another fight scene with it. I'm telling you, go back and watch that whole scene and tell me which side of the castle the orcs are on because it makes zero sense. I will decide. They're definitely, <laughs> they're definitely trying to kick like the knights off of like the balconies. And yeah, stuff. exactly. To right. see them trying to climb. Right. I, I'm not arguing that they're fighting humans, but they are simultaneously inside the castle fighting humans and also trying to break into the castle to fight more humans. I, I don't even know mm. that that aside, I am, I am anxious to, to get through these questions so that I can hear more from Casey as to whether or not he likes this movie because he has remained stunningly silent and taken both sides of the argument here. So <laughs> unlike season one, um, we have uh, made a few cuts to our five questions. We've whittled it, whittled it down to three, three <gasps> questions that are hopefully more poignant and will get us to our, our goal, which is, was this a good movie? Um, so without further ado, let's play three questions. Okay, so question number one, and we'll start with Lauren on this one. Uh, oh, was the, what was the message of the film, and do you agree with it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the message of the film was that guardian angels can come from anywhere. Basically, I I, t I took the message as you can have an impact on somebody's life. Uh, basically, no matter what, and it's up to you to either make that a good impact or not. That is a uh, profound message from this movie. <laughs> that is amazing <laughs> that you got that out of this, uh, Casey. What are, What are your thoughts? What was the message, and do you agree with it? Um, I thought the message was that females are powerful even when they're being exploited. <laughs> That's very interesting. I actually, I watched this with my wife and I told her this is supposed to be a female empowerment movie movie. And she did not see where that was a exactly. plausible, <laughs> a plausible uh, thing. Um, okay. So question number two, we'll start with Casey this time. How did the movie leave you feeling? And do you think it was intentional? <laughs> well, I mean, if you feel confused, I don't necessarily <laughs> think that Zack Snyder intended that. I, I read a comment. I don't know if it's true or not, is that Zack Snyder had this idea for a movie, um, but didn't have it like fully fleshed out. <laughs> and after, um, I think they did Dawn of the Dead for New Line. Mm -hmm. And then he, which is owned by Warner Brothers, and then he did Watchmen, and those were both successful films. So that when it came to do Sucker Punch and pre Superman, he was kind of like, "Well, I'll do this. I want to do this. You know what I mean? Like, I want to do this passion movie um, before I get into you know kicking off this new universe." So Warner Brothers was kind of like stuck more or less probably where it was like well okay we'll let you do this i mean really 80 million dollars for what you see in that movie I, it's crazy i didn't realize that budget was so low if you would have told me it was a 200 million dollar movie i would have said okay you know other than like the lack of you know big name actors other than that i mean it looks amazing um and but i also know that Zack snyder can stretch a stretch a dollar 
Um, anyway, so I I feel like this is just it. Is that Zack Snyder had an idea of you know cute girls going through video game scenes and perfect like quote unquote jerk off material for guys. <laughs> and then when they were like, okay, we'll give you the money for it, he was like, whoa, shit. All right, well, uh, but actually, it's not just about that. It's about this. And they're like, okay, whatever. We already gave you the money and just, just go make shoot it. it. And yeah, like he was like, well, you know, I don't want to be like just about jerk off material. I mean, really, the girls are, are powerful and uh, <laughs> they're guardian <laughs> angels. So how about that? <laughs> so, so do you, I mean, you think that was intentional or do you think... At the end, Zack Snyder finishes the editing and he looks at this final product. You think he's happy with this? I think he goes, I already got paid for Man of Steel. Let me start (laughs) pre-production and we'll see what happens with this. Honestly, 100%. Okay. All right. Uh, Question number three. This is back to Lauren. What was the most important sequence in the movie? Important, not kick-ass. Yeah, but I've I've got (laughs) to... Um, I would say the, I might say the sequence just that, uh, where Rocket's killed, um, to me, because you're losing, uh, one of your central characters, I won't call her a main character, but you're losing a central character who also then kicks off the killing of two other characters because Blue has now found out about all of this stuff. It also kind of unhinges Baby Doll because her sister was just murdered. So I kind of think that that sequence or that specific event kind of triggered the domino effect of the rest of the movie. Casey, what do you think? I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's at that point where... You've been kind of just like I think Lauren touched on it before. It's been kind of like a fantasy world up until that point, you know, or no, you said it where like it's kind of easy that they got the, you know, Easter yeah. eggs or keys or whatever. Um, and then once that happens and it and they fail, then it's like, oh, there's actual consequences outside of the, you know, the looming uh, high roller that's coming in. So, so you've actually you've made several comments to you know with the Easter egg and the video game and the bosses and everything. Is there is there evidence that this is like video game premised? No, this is just kind of like what you're you're picking up on. Yeah, you know, I mean it's not want... like uh, Ready Player One, you know, where it's literal keys, Easter eggs, <laughs> video right. games. So this, this might just be like you have video games on the mind right now or something. I mean, I might. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I mean, I mean so, you you didn't get that from the movies at all. Um, I I think it makes sense, um, especially with the the idea that of it being boss fights, because when she does her dance and she goes into these you know alternate worlds, um, there usually is one big baddie. I mean, there's a bunch of like like we mentioned the orgs, but the orgs ultimately lead to the dragon fight, and you. You had the three stone samurais and, um, you know, even with the, the zombie Nazis, there's tons of zombie Nazis, but there's like one general she's going after. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, I think the, the allegory that they are, you know, big boss fights in a video game is very well put. Um, I, I don't know outside of that though, if I see any more video game esqueness to it, you know, it doesn't, I don't get the sense of levels, the, Worlds that she goes into don't seem very connected. In fact, she's the only one in the first world, um, whereas the other girls join the other ones. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I I can see the connection, but I don't think it's strong. That's why I was wondering if maybe it was something that, you know, Snyder had said in an interview or something. I don't think it's necessarily this is following Castlevania or this is following The Legend of Zelda. It's just video game tropes. Mm. And you know play you you an rpg writer would know just like an rpg video game player you need these things in order to beat the big bad that is in 
almost any video game, but especially role playing games. So it's if you quest. go off of with, yeah, I mean, like this is a quest, a key, a map, <laughs> fire. I mean, I think that's literally the first Zelda game. <laughs> like, yeah. So that's all like, yeah, they're not all in the same world of Hyrule, but they are all one big quest. I took that first. You mentioned that she was the only one in the first boss fight, as we call it. And I took that as her tutorial. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she's, me too. She's being mm. given her weapons. Yep. And she's being given what her main quest line is. Learn how to navigate the wise in man this world. Yeah. Yep. And then the next one, the wise man said, oh, and try and work together. So it's showing like, okay, now you went from your single fight to your second one, which is work as a group. Um, wait, was that the third one? The well, one? no, they still do in two, but we don't know if those girls have ever had to do this before. Like they seem pretty adept. Uh, like it could all again be inside just Sweet Pea's mind, but those other girls all seem to know how to handle guns and like, get yeah. through things too. Maybe they've all been through their own sort of hero quest. We don't know in a different way. Right. right. Huh. I did think the, the mech that um, one of the actresses uses in, in one of the boss fights is pretty cool. Yeah. Amber. Mm-hmm. It's a, did you see what was painted on the outside? A pink bunny, I think. Right. Yeah, I thought that it was. I thought that it was weird that it was pink. I thought that they should have kept it as like a white rabbit, but you know, um, play more off of the Alice through the Looking Glass type story. That, that that's a good connection. I didn't pick up on that. I think the white rabbit would have been more direct. Um, it doesn't surprise me they changed it to pink because again, I could see them saying like, "Oh, you know, chicks, pink. Let's let's do that." Unless the old man's the white rabbit. Oh, okay. Because he's old, and he's white hair. <laughs> he's white hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So with that, we got the three questions. Uh, we talked about the plot. Um, now I'm anxiously waiting. You guys know my answer. Was this a good movie? I don't think so. I think it's got a lot of good scenes. <laughs> I think it's got a lot of good qualities. Um, but at the end of the day, it winds up being multiple puzzle pieces that don't quite fit together. Um, Lauren, what do you think? Was this a good movie? So, um, in previous podcasts, I don't believe on, I might have said this on our previous Gutsy Media podcast, but the way that I judge a movie is if I am entertained in the slightest. I go to a movie to be entertained, to be taken out of reality, and to be entertained for 90 minutes or however long. And my first sitting in this movie, I absolutely was entertained. Um, now, is it a good movie for others? Probably not. Because most people don't judge movies the way that I do. So, as I said, this is one of my all-time favorite movies, but it's maybe not a good movie. So interesting, I, interesting. I, so, I, I will, I will always, I, I will admit that I have a very strange selection of movies that I consider to be some of my favorites, and some of them aren't the best movies critically or even by viewers so <laughs> so i mean the I, ones can, I like i can not only understand and appreciate that but i i admire that so you're saying still one of your favorite movies still mm-hmm. still a movie that you love to watch and is entertaining but you can see that you don't think it's a good movie mm-hmm. yeah I, oh, yes. i'm interested like what's another one on your list like uh, what's another shitty movie but like you love it Oh, we've well, all I, got one. We've all got one. I I feel like this is usually my go-to. Uh, but, I mean, a lot of people don't like the Resident Evil movies. That's true. That's true. Although they keep uh, getting the And we know hates. I love those. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm trying to think of some other ones. I mean, Butter. Is... Have you ever seen Butter? Yeah. That's, that's a um, Jennifer Aniston. Yes. Yeah, it's a good movie. Though. Wait, that's it. She like yeah, yeah. Won like indie awards for that. Like that's a good movie. Wait, is it Jennifer Aniston? Hold on. Yes, it. Is. There's a whole bunch of people in that movie. Yeah. Um, you should watch that movie, Bob. I, I've never, never even heard of it. I will, Netflix. 
It might be on Netflix. I will check it out. My my two awful movies that are top of my list is, as you guys probably both know, uh, Snake Eyes, Nicolas Cage, and uh, Basic with John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson. In my opinion, both phenomenal movies, both noir-esque movies, both very uniquely shot movies with flashbacks, and uh, I love those two. But they're not considered bad movies. I was going to say, Basic's not a I, bad movie. I don't... I, I guess, not, I guess, on, I guess either one of them are bad They're not blockbusters. They're not well known. I, I have I've met very few people who have seen them. If you said you loved uh, soccer punch, I mean, really, like there's, you know what I mean. Like if you said you loved like Air Bud or something, like maybe. But the, I think those two movies don't count. What about they got to be like kicking it old school with Jamie Kennedy. Like that's got to be like your like. <laughs> This is great. <laughs> Gili. Yeah, uh, that. Uh, Biodome. I absolutely love Biodome. Yeah, anything with Polly Shore <laughs> automatically adds you into that. That's Oh, come on. What's the one where he's in the army? That's a good movie. In the army now. Yeah, that's a good movie. No, you know what is a good movie, though, is Son-in-Law with Carla Giugino. I mean, that's She's basically... the girl. <laughs> is she... That's crazy. A very young role for her. Oh. Um, I mean, that's basically, he plays the exact same character in every movie. Yeah, which is exactly. Yeah, he does. Um, but you're not, you're not going to skirt the question, Casey. What do you think? Was this a good movie? So I, you know, I was watching it again, um, and I haven't watched it in a couple of years. And I, and I was like, you know, I, I can watch this at two times speed. And I think I'll get the same. <laughs> I think I'll get the same feeling out of this. <laughs> I didn't lose anything in the translation. <laughs> so, so despite our our love or hatred for this movie, we are in consensus. I think that this is this is a bad movie. It's it's yeah by by the actual terms of what a bad movie <laughs> is. It is. It's a critical failure. Nobody really likes it, but. To, to Lauren's point, I've watched this movie many times. Um, <laughs> I will continue to watch it, even though it doesn't make any sense. But it's just fucking cool. It's just a cool movie. <laughs> yeah, like, is, is it a good movie? No. Should you watch it at least once in your life? Yes. Yeah, for fair, sure. Fair. I don't know anyone I, I also who has watched the movie and been like, I wasted my time. Because there's so many cool sequences in it that it's like, I don't need to see that again, or that was bad, but no one has ever been like, give me my money back, or you 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 know what I mean? Like how some people are like, this movie was horrible. No one has ever, that I've talked to, ever done that. They're just like, well, that doesn't make any sense, and that was kind of stupid, and they exploited these women, but at least you can still see like, hey, they, you know, fought steam nazis and it was nazis. Awesome. <laughs> they yeah, blew I mean, up a blimp they yeah, uh had, very well had put. flying rabbit yeah i don't know anybody that's watched this like you said and said you know that movie was truly horrible yeah. um and and i think anybody that watches it even even us uh, during the course of this conversation have pointed out you know very positive things about it um so that's great so um the next thing i'd like to do with you guys if you don't mind is we're going to play a little game called guess that tomato Ooh. Oh, wait, is there not? Uh, good Ooh. music cue. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know, Guess That Tomato is where we go to Rotten Tomatoes and we figure out what the audience has scored this movie. And uh, then I'm going to give you guys a couple of hints and we'll come back and see if you want to change your scores. So let's start with Lauren. Lauren, what do you think 96,763 people average rated this movie? Sucker Punch, 2011, from 0 to 100. And this is not critics. This is just viewers. This is just viewers. Forty-two. Okay, forty-two. Casey, what do you think? Man, I was gonna go really high. I was gonna go like seventy something. But Lauren has a good point, and most people don't really like this movie. I'm gonna say the opposite. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Wow. 
So I will tell you that 218 critics have rated this movie an average of a 22. Ah. I'm also going to give you three movies that are within 2% of this rating. So plus or minus 2% of Sucker Punch, and you get these three movies. Number one, Red Sparrow, the 2018 Jennifer Lawrence movie centered around a Russian spy who... Who am I kidding? No one watched past the nude scenes. Movie number two, X-Men Apocalypse. This time, the X-Men join forces to fight the biggest, most deadly enemy of all, Ivan Ooze. And movie number three. Did you write these? I did. They're pretty good, right? (laughs) They're pretty good. (laughs) Movie number three, The Great Gatsby. That's right. You know that book your teacher made you read in high school? Yeah, they made it into a movie. Let me just tell you, that is a fantastic movie. <laughs> um, and I think part of the reason why I loved it so much is because I saw it in 3D. And they did some really good stuff in it. Plus, I like Boz Lerman. Really? Yeah. yeah you, you are the, the picture-perfect audience for a 3D film. If it's... I mean, if it's good, yeah. <laughs> but I mean... I'm, what did they do 3D in that movie? Uh, you know, so like that famous gif of him like with the glass like glass. explosions everywhere i mean it really and there's a lot of like dancing and i don't know it was weird it was very visual think so, about moulin rouge it's the same dude who directed that if that was in 3d you would be like oh wow there's an elephant coming after me so <laughs> instead of things really popping out at you or is it more like an in-depth of like you were in it like right like i feel like yeah 3D, yeah no, like so like gimmick. avatar yeah, like, um, it was a mix. There was some stuff that was coming at you, but mostly of it was looking for their depth of field. All right, I so also, isn't Oscar Isaacs in Apocalypse? He is Apocalypse. That's what I was trying to look up awesome, over here. sir. Um, so, okay. Like, so based on those hints, Lauren, you originally said 42. Do you want to change probably, your score? Yeah, way down. What are you going to go with now? He Casey said, said 24. 24. I don't want to be a jerk and say like 25 and make it just above. <laughs> Do what you I think you're going to get just above or just below. So I'll go I'll go 25 and be hopeful. 25. All right, Casey, do you want to change your, your guess? I do. Because of Gatsby, I'm going to 27. 27. <laughs> the audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes for Sucker Punch 2011 is... Forty-seven. Oh, Lauren, you were so close with your first guess. Dang it! <laughs> oh, I should have stuck with it. Stick with your gut instinct. Yeah. Always, always. Well, this has been a pleasure talking about this movie. Really appreciate the suggestion. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time out. Before I let you go, it is a firm believer of. Casey and the other owner of Don't Forget a Towel, <laughs> that everybody geeks out on something. While it may not be comic books and movies, maybe it's killing Nazi robots or jumping out of helicopters. So before I let you guys go, I got to ask you, what is it you're geeking out on now? Let's start with Casey. My new PlayStation 5. <laughs> <laughs> so what games have you gotten with it? So you get 20 PlayStation 4 games just for buying it. Uh, if you were a PlayStation Network subscriber, which I have been, which is the only reason why I even have it. Like, I got a special invite because of being a longtime PlayStation Network subscriber to buy it directly from Sony. So I didn't go through the Walmart and, and Best Buy and all that uh, rigmarole. So, um, but I bought, you know, as a Spider Man fan, as you know, I bought the Miles Morales game, which I was playing before we jumped on tonight. And it is awesome. <laughs> Is it is it an actual it fully separate awesome. game or is it like no it's a whole new game? It's a whole oh, new I game. thought I thought I heard somewhere. It was I like think it's probably like, I mean, I, I'm a slow game player because just in general I like to take my time and be. I've got a kid, so everything's in like 15 minute increments. But um, <laughs> I think this is like half the length of the other one, but I'm sure they'll keep adding like DLC and stuff. So I'm I'm good. Cool. Very cool. Laura, what about you? What are you geeking out on? I was just going to make a side comment that I, I didn't see your name when I was stickering all the PlayStations last night, so I knew you didn't get it from Best Buy. Yeah. <laughs> Not your Best Buy, anyway. I mean, there's a couple. Fair enough. Of them. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Um, I am. Casey mentioned he's a slow game player. Um, I am as well in two senses of the word. I'm usually very slow on jumping onto a game because I'm playing older games. Mm-hmm. Um, and also because I need to explore every corner. And... That's what I'm like. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Dana, who is not a gamer, my fiance, um, actually likes to watch me play a couple specific games and we're currently playing through the last of us part two, because I never played through that. And, uh, she, she loved the first one. So we're, I'd say we're probably about halfway through the second one right now. And that's what we were doing right before uh, we started casting. Um, is it as I good, ha- better, worse? I enjoy it. Uh, it's I don't. Good. It's a lot of people didn't like it. I think a lot of people didn't like it for one specific reason that you and know it's about. Related. Yeah. Well, sorry, two specific reasons. Now that I think about it, um, right. one of them is like people who are just bigots and the other one is like people who can't accept changes in story even though time does move on and those are both invalid reasons and so far i love this game even though i have to play it in chunks because it is so depressing (laughs) it is oh my gosh so depressing (laughs) not ruining any story or anything but the first time you have to kill a dog i was like nope nope (laughs) I can't do it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I cannot do it. Um, but so I'm doing that, and I have made the conscious decision to not purchase a PS5 for the time being. So we'll see how long you hold out for. <laughs> I, I, I was... as soon as they actually release Cyberpunk and it comes out on the PS5, I'm gonna either have Fair to enough. get, I'm gonna have to get that, and then uh, I also withheld from purchasing. Assassin's Creed Valhalla because I know that's going to be a large chunk of time and I never beat Odyssey because I was like I just can't do this anymore (laughs) yeah I made the decision to buy a PS5 however my bank account made the decision not to so it looks like (laughs) my bank went out Um, I'm with you on the Valhalla thing though so I I played Assassin's Creed pretty religiously when they first came out like the first two or three games Um, but then it got real repetitive so I kind of gave it up I, I did get a copy of black flag through some sort of sale or buy to get one free type thing. I played that for a little while. Um, but Valhalla looks amazing. It does. And the only reason why I haven't kind of pre-ordered it or, or gotten on that list is because I'll probably end up getting it for the PS five, which I'm sure I will own at some point mm-hmm. in the future. Um, uh, me personally, I'm geeking out on or just finished geeking out on medieval. They did the remaster for the PS four. I bought it. I kind of sat on my shelf for a little while, but then I started playing it. And it's actually one of those games that is so kind of cartoony that my kids uh, actually really enjoyed watching me play. And we just beat it um, a couple days ago. So that was really cool. And uh, I got um, God of War 4, 5, the most recent one. um, God of War. Just God of War. Um, I got that for Father's Day, I think. Um, but I was in the middle of medieval, so I'm going to play that next. Unfortunately, the kids will not be watching me play that. That's one of the greatest games I've ever played. That game is in my life. amazing. In my can't life. Wait to start. Also, uh, tying reference into another uh, DFAT podcast, uh, did you not mention medieval on a specific PlayStation podcast? You, he did. The original. Those geeks, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was one of so I I it came out. One <laughs> like, of the first. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been sitting on the shelf for a while. One of the first games I really got into as a kid that really launched my my video game love was Zelda: Link to the Past on Super Nintendo, um, and that was because my mom actually played it, and then she went right from that to Super Goals and Ghosts. Uh, both very story heavy sort of RPG type games, um, and then of course. Super Mario kind of follows that same storyline, Crash Bandicoot, um, and then Medieval. So, I mean, I, I really like those types of world, you know, problem-solving, um, level-up type games. Um, and that's kind of what I've gotten attached to. Nice. Yeah, man. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to to have this podcast. Anything you guys want to plug or speak on before we sign off here? 
Listen to Don't Forget to Tell. <laughs> Listen to Tell They Talk, another podcast on this network. So um, we appreciate that geeking out sort of thing. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>